Well, good evening and welcome to Wednesdays in the Word, the weekly online study of the Bible hosted by Lebanon Rock Church. This is Pastor Matt Skiles and we welcome you to our study for this Wednesday evening, July the 17th, 2024. We're continuing our current lesson series titled Breaking Free and we're going to be looking at lesson number three tonight, which is Finding Joy in life's hardships. So as always, I want to remind you to make sure that you have brought your Bible with you or your tablet or your smartphone, whatever your Bible app is. Um, I'm sure it's going to be more than helpful for tonight. Of course, if you have something to drink, I have my coffee as always right here by me. And so we're going to go to the Lord in prayer and we're going to get right into this lesson tonight uh, on finding joy in life's hardships. So join with me as we pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your goodness and your mercy upon our lives. Father, we just pray that you will be with us as we begin this study here tonight. We pray, Lord, that you'll give your word free course in our hearts and our lives. We pray that everything that we say and everything that we study tonight will encourage and uplift us and strengthen us and help us to find joy in the hardships of life as we break free from the bondage of our past. And we give you thanks and praise now and ask your blessings upon our study, both in person and here online tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's get right into the lesson. And as I mentioned the last two weeks, uh, in this series of lessons, we've been looking at how we can completely break free from our past so that we can live successful and productive lives in the here and the now. And in this lesson today, I want to continue to share with you on the subject of finding joy in the midst of life's hardships. Um, and of course, in the previous uh, week's lessons, we've looked at uh, how we can find healing for uh, the wounded spirit. And we also looked at how we can overcome our past and, uh, and find healing uh, from our past. And so tonight, we're going to focus on breaking free here by finding joy in life's hardships. So in James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, you're welcome to go there if you'd like. We see what we're going to focus on here tonight. In James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, James writes, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Now, I'm going to ask you, do you really take that verse of Scripture seriously? And you might laugh and say, sure I do, Pastor Skiles. But the truth is, if we really desire the liberating power of God's Spirit and His kingdom's presence in our lives, we must find joy in life's hardships. Uh, in the previous lessons, we saw that there are a number of things that cause hardship in our lives, that cause pain, that cause hurt, such as sickness, family tragedies, being out of work, financial difficulties, family problems, um, and other major calamities, you know, and, uh, and there's been a lot of things that can happen. Uh, we could have a natural disaster, or it could be a loss of job, a death in our family, a lot of things. And yet we're told in the scriptures to be of good cheer. And what Jesus was saying there when he said be of good cheer was he saying that we must learn to find joy in the midst of those hardships because he has overcome the world. In John 16 and 33, Jesus said, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. In the previous lessons, we've looked at, at hardships and trials and suffering and, uh, and how they are necessary in our lives. And with that in mind, we need to also focus here tonight on why hardships come, because they're going to happen to all of us. Jesus said in John 16 and 33, these things I've spoken to you, then in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. But also, too, uh, it's important to understand that those struggles and hardships a lot of times are working in our life. They're working in our situation, helping us to not only draw closer to God, but grow in our faith and strengthen our faith. And when our faith is tested and when we go through the hardships of life, 
uh, we can understand how we can be better Christians, how we can draw closer to the Lord, and how our faith is strengthened when we can find joy in those hardships. We're not saying, oh, gee, I'm happy that all of this is happening to me. But the joy of the Lord gives us the strength to get through it. So let's look at our first point tonight, and that's this. How to find joy in the midst of hardship. How to find joy in the midst of hardship. And I want us to look at some scriptural principles here on, of faith as to how we can successfully, with joy, uh, draw waters from the wells of salvation in times of difficulty. Because that's really what we have to do. And in Isaiah chapter 12, verses 2 and 3, the prophet says, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For yea, the Lord is my strength and my song. He also has become my salvation. Therefore, with joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. So how do we find joy in the midst of hardship? You notice here that Isaiah says, you know, with joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. We'll trust and not be afraid. The joy of the Lord and the joy that we have in midst of hardship is seen whenever we can be thankful, even when things don't, don't go our way, even when we're struggling with circumstances and problems in our life. So how do you find joy in the midst of hardship? Well, one way is we must completely let go of the past. And in Philippians chapter 3 and verse 13, we read where Paul writes, Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but the one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. And, and so what is Paul saying? That Paul is saying that he is putting those things behind him, but he's reaching forward. He's not living in the past. Until we are really free from the past, we'll never have the joy that is needed to deal with today's problems and today's circumstances and trials. Paul recognized the weight of the past was a great hindrance to him, so he let it go. We have to do the same. Uh, there's so much for us to reach forward to with a, with a sense of anticipation and hope, but we have to let go of the past before the joy and the hope of the future can fully settle in. Another way that we can find joy in the midst of, of hardship here. Secondly, we must have a vision that is greater than the struggle. Proverbs 29 and 18 says, Where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint. But happy is he who keeps the law. It is vision that sustains us in the midst of life's hardships because it gives us the ability to see beyond that which is taking place in our lives momentarily. It enables us to not lose heart in the midst of the problem. As we continue to focus on our vision of what God has in store for us, uh, as well as the blessing of eternal bliss, we're able to see whatever we're going through as only a momentary affliction. In, in 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18, Paul writes, Therefore, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary but the things which are not seen are eternal. And, and so, you know, it's important for us, you know, um, you know, it's important for us to really, really, really grasp a hold of that and understand that. You know, there's a famous art gallery in Germany and, um, and, and there's a painting in one of those, one of those German art galleries called Cloud Lane, which hangs at the end of this long, dark hall. It appears at first to be a huge, ugly mass of confused color, unattractive and very foreboding. But as you walk closer to it and upon closer examination, you see an innumerable company of angels. Uh, Theodore Kyler writes, how often the soul that is frightened by a trial sees nothing but a uh, a conglomeration of broken expectations. 
But if we analyze the situation from a position of faith, we will soon discover that the cloud is God's wonderful chariot of providence full of angels of mercy. And that's very, very true. We don't see a lot of times what God sees, and we don't see the big picture. Sometimes we're so overwhelmed by trials and circumstances and hardships that we don't see the forest from the trees. We don't see God's ultimate plan. And a great example of this is, is Joseph. In Genesis 37, verses 5 through 11, we see the story of Joseph and his brothers. And it says, now Joseph had a dream, and he told it to his brothers, and they hated him even more. So he said to them, please hear this dream which I have dreamed. And they were, there, there we were, he says, binding sheaves in the field. Then behold, my sheaf arose and also stood upright, and indeed your sheaf stood all around and bowed down to my sheaf. And his brothers said, and said to him, Shall you indeed reign over us? Or shall you indeed have dominion over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Then he dreamed still another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Look, I have dreamed another dream. And this time the sun, the moon, and the eleven stars bowed down to me. So he told it to his father and his brothers. And his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come to bow down to the earth before you? And his brothers envied him, but his father kept the matter in mind. Now, Joseph is a great example of a person who experienced his share of hardships. His brothers hated him because of these dreams that he had. They later sold him into slavery, and he was put later into prison for something he didn't do, and yet... All of this happened in his life, but he was still able to find joy. Joseph's brothers hated him, and instead of killing him, they sold him to Egyptian slave, uh, slave owners, and he was sold into slavery in Egypt. He worked for a man named Potiphar, and Potiphar's house prospered because the Lord was with Joseph. But Potiphar's wife uh, sought to, uh, uh, sought to uh, you know, become romantically involved with Joseph and, and cast her eyes at Joseph and wanted her to lie with him or wanted him to lie with her and he wouldn't do it. And she then, of course, accused him of forcing himself on her and, uh, and sexually assaulting her. And then he was cast in to prison. And from there, we read in Genesis 39 and 22, it says, and the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever they did there, it was his doing so. God prospered Joseph everywhere he went. When he was with his father uh, in his father's house, his father was Jacob. Um, you know, God had given him these dreams. And then when he was with the house of Potiphar, working and serving under Potiphar, God had prospered Potiphar's house because of Joseph. And Joseph was well favored and was well respected. Later, when he went into prison after being falsely accused, uh, the, the keeper of the prison committed all those things to Joseph's hand because Joseph was blessed of God. And because of this unwavering attitude that Joseph had in the midst of difficulty, Joseph eventually sees his dreams come to fulfillment. Because at some point, while Joseph was in prison, um, of course, he, is, he encounters uh, not only the cupbearer, but the baker of Pharaoh, who was the king of Egypt. And they each had dreams. Joseph interpreted those dreams and told them one of them um, would be restored back to his place uh, in the house of Pharaoh, and the other one would be hung or would be killed. And sure enough, both of those, both of those dreams happened just as uh, Joseph said they would. And of course, then Pharaoh has two dreams. And of course, uh, he saw the seven healthy grains and the seven sickly grains, he saw the seven healthy cows and the seven sickly cows. And when he saw the vision of the grains that were sickly consuming the healthy grains and the, and the seven uh, sick cows that consumed the seven healthy cows, when he had those two dreams, no one could interpret the dream. And then Joseph was able to interpret the dream for him. And in one day, Joseph went from being in prison to becoming the governor of Egypt and riding second chair to Pharaoh. So now everything that Joseph had dreamed and everything that God had showed Joseph had come to pass. 
God's plan for Joseph had never changed. God's plan for Joseph had never been altered. And so now we see here in this story where Joseph is, is now in that place where uh, he is going to uh, be in the place where his brothers will come and bow down to him because the seven, the seven grains and the seven cows represented seven years. The good, healthy cows and the good, healthy grains represented seven years of plenty. And the sick, sickly grains and the sickly cows represented seven years of, of famine. And so Joseph was charged with the task, as he had told Pharaoh, to collect one-fifth of all the harvest and store it and put it in storage. So when there comes the famine on the, uh, and the drought on the land of Egypt, there would be grain enough for everyone to have. And so Pharaoh put, uh, he put uh, Joseph in charge of that and made him the governor of Egypt. Not only that, but then whenever his father, his father's house and his brothers were stricken by the famine, they came to Egypt to receive grain. And there they bowed to, his, they bowed to Joseph. And of course, Joseph would later through a different series of acts would reveal himself to his brothers and there would be a great restoration and reconciliation and eventually he would move his father and family and his entire clan all the way to Egypt where they settled in the land of Goshen and it was there where they would stay and that was ultimately where they were at when Moses was to come out several hundred years later and lead them out of Egypt's bondage under a different Pharaoh back to the promised land of Canaan. But at that particular point, um, Jacob was still alive, and Jacob and his family and his home came, and they were reunited with Joseph. And of course, once Jacob had died, Joseph's brothers thought that he was now going to retaliate against him, and they thought for sure he would take his revenge. And in Genesis 50, in verse 20, when you start looking at the story of Joseph from Genesis 37, all the way to Genesis 50. In those 13, 14 passages of Scripture, you see this story play out. And, and when they thought that, that Joseph was going to take vengeance against him in, in Genesis 50 and verse 20, Joseph said, But as for you, you meant evil against me, he said, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. So they thought whenever Joseph revealed himself and they realized the authority, the power that Joseph had, that he was certainly going to take vengeance, and he didn't. And so we must have a vision that's greater than the struggle. Joseph had a vision that was greater than the struggles he went through. We have to completely let go of the past, first of all. Then we have to have a vision that is greater than the struggle. And that takes us to the third area where we, we find joy in the hardships of life, and that is we must focus on the growth that God desires to bring. God always desires to use hardships in our lives to teach us to rely on Him and to use them as an opportunity for growth and maturity. Our growth and maturity comes out of the hard lessons of life, not the easy ones. Romans chapter 5 verses 3 through 5 says, and not only that, Paul writes, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulations produce perseverance, a perseverance, character, and character, hope. Now, hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So we have to focus on the growth that God desires to bring forth in our life because that's what happens. Fourthly, uh, we have to trust in the Lord in all things. If we're truly going to find joy in life's hardships, we have to trust the Lord in all things. Proverbs uh, and Psalms uh, give us a great deal of study and insight into how we trust the Lord and how we can lean on the Lord. Psalm 5, verse 11 and 12 says, But let all those rejoice who put their trust in you. Let them ever shout for joy because you defend them. Let those who also love your name be joyful in you. For you, O Lord, will bless the righteous. With favor you will surround him as with a shield. Our ability to continually trust in God is a very strong key element in our availability 
and ability to find joy in the midst of life's hardships. Because trust enables us to know deep within our heart and our soul that everything is really all right. It enables us not to get anxious. And in Psalm 37, verses 3 and 4, it says, Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. And in Philippians 4, verses 4 through 7, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men, for the Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing. But by everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And in Psalm 125 and verse 1, those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved, but abide forever. So we look here again at these four things that we do here when we're talking about um, breaking free and finding joy in life's hardships. We have to completely let go of the past. We have to have a vision that's greater than the struggle. Uh, we have to uh, focus on the growth that God desires to bring forth. And we must trust the Lord in all things. We do that, um, and we remember to do that. We will know that we can have joy in the midst of life's hardships and that our joy will give us strength to be an overcomer in all the things that we face in this life. So that's our lesson for tonight, lesson number three. So let's bow our heads as we close tonight with a word of prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity we've had here this evening to study this wonderful lesson from your word. Father, we thank you that we uh, can not only uh, look to your word and study your word. But Father, we thank you that we have we have the ability to have joy in the midst of our hardships. Father, help us to understand that the struggles and, and trials and issues that we face are only there to give us strength and to encourage us. Help us, Father, I pray that we can find joy in life's hardships. Help us, Lord, to always trust in you and to look unto you, Lord Jesus, as the author and finisher of our faith. We pray that you'll bless us the remainder of this week. We pray that you'll give us a good week, a blessed week. And we ask you to bless our uh, time together now and bless us, bring us back Sunday at the appointed time as we gather again for another online worship service. And we give you thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you for joining with me this evening. And from all of us here at Lebanon Rock Church, we wish you a very happy and blessed remainder to your week. Be sure to join us this coming Sunday for another online worship service. And from all of us here at Lebanon Rock Church, we say God bless you. Thanks for being with us tonight. We love you, and we appreciate you being so faithful to join with us each week. And we'll see you all next time.